Hey, good evening, everyone. Glad you're here. Hey, good turnout tonight. I'm uh, grateful for you. And for you guys watching online, grateful for you also. Uh, my name is Steve Tomlinson. I'm one of the teaching pastors at the church. And something that I have been doing probably since 2004 or so is teaching through the Bible verse by verse. And um, I've gone through the whole New Testament. I've gone through a good chunk of the Old Testament. And there are some books that I still have not done, and Jeremiah was one of those. And so it's uh, my fun to learn with you guys. Um, I remember very well my brother, who was seven years older than me, he told me, I'm going through the Bible this year. And when he got to Jeremiah, he said, this was so hard to get through. You know, it was, it was difficult. And, but I have also found when I taught through Isaiah verse by verse, the words came to life. And now Isaiah is my favorite book in the Bible. I just love quoting it, talking about it, thinking about it. And so I am excited about the opportunity to go through the book of Jeremiah and to be stretched and grow and just discover what God has for us. But right from the beginning, we're going to discover it's challenging. This man had a challenging life. Without any further ado, though, let's open in prayer, and then we will uh, dig in. Father, I thank you so much that we have the privilege tonight to study your word. And our goal, Lord, is to be transformed by it, that it's not purely an academic exercise, but it is also something that grows us to be the men, women that you've called us to be. So in the end, Father, please be glorified in everything we do tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me give you a handle on what it's like, because I see some students that haven't taken a class with me before. Every class pretty much has a quiz, including tonight. Why would he give a quiz on the first day of class? Because I am a sadistic teacher and I love pain. Now, seriously, tonight's quiz functions somewhat as an introduction. It's going to give you some information. You're never handing these quizzes in. However, they build on each other. And as you go through a quiz, number one, many people find it kind of like a puzzle. They're putting together each week and they find it interesting. I will get emails saying, Pastor Steve, I can't be there tonight. Can you send me the quiz? And you know, it becomes kind of a fun thing. There's usually never more than 10 questions and it is usually material from the previous lesson focusing almost exclusively on the book we're studying and the section of the book we are studying. So get used to it, there'll be a quiz. And when it comes to you folks watching online, um, we usually have those posted on the page where you register for the class. So if you did not register for the class, you would not see the quiz. That being said, I'm not absolutely positive it was posted this week. Um, but there'll be other postings that will come up shortly for those watching online. And secondly, our classes go to around nine o'clock. I try to ever to go past nine o'clock, occasionally two or three minutes past that. But it's for the sake of, um, you know, just having a time frame so people can, can plan and, and how long it's going to be. And the other thing is, even though it is lecture style, I do welcome questions. But your teacher is deaf as a post. And so if you raise your hand and I say, what was your question? And I see, you know, some lips moving. I will probably say to the person near you, can you translate what this person says? And then somebody can shout what the question was. And then I can hear, the, you know, give the answer as best as I know. So do keep that in mind. One of the downsides of a big room like this is I'm very far from you. One of the perks of a big room like this is it's very a lot more COVID safe. What was that, Wayne? Because you're very far from us. Right. Yes. <laughs> it, is, it is comfortable seating too, though. It has other perks. Wayne now is somebody that if he's close, I might throw something at him from time to time because uh, my, uh, my brother can razz me and I enjoy razzing him in the, in the same way. In fact, during the peak of COVID, when we only had my brother watching online, 
it was almost painful not being able to razz each other as it's going on um, because uh, that was that was a lot of fun so I am truly excited that you guys are here um, if you're interested uh, if you can't make a Monday you're welcome to go to Syosset on Wednesday be the same class but I as a general rule I'm going to videotape the Monday class and then uh, Wednesday will be it might be a better class because I'll know the material better but it will not be the one that is uh, videotaped and so you can flip trade watch online whatever you would like to do that uh, fits your fancy and the other thing to keep in mind somebody came up to me on Sunday and said pastor Steve is this gonna be like so over my head that I'm gonna like zone out instantaneously now it might feel that way sometimes a little bit but one thing pastor nathan put it this way he said steve you tell so many stories and the regulars they go oh he's telling that story you know and they're, they're kind of used to it and the the people who are newer they're like oh i haven't heard that story you know so you'll hear a lot of my stories because the text causes me to you know my mind becomes fertile with ideas and and things and all that kind of stuff now with that in mind i want to introduce you to somebody in the back row dr pete could you stand up just for a moment here dr pete lesneski he's a medical doctor and so uh although he doesn't want to hear all your complaints about your aches and pains and things like that he uh is also he takes that same prowess with medicine and he applies it to biblical study. And so there will be some times that Dr. Pete may be teaching. And uh, he comes, in all honesty, he is currently more familiar with the book of Jeremiah than I am because he has been studying and preparing and, and gearing up because he's gonna be teaching it at Limbrook Baptist. But um, he is my alternate along with uh, occasionally Pastor Nathan. Um, but uh, Pastor Nathan has elder meetings on Monday nights and a few other complications that make him not as available. So what we're going to do now is look at our quiz. So if you take that quiz out and it says on the top of it, quiz, um, this is our first quiz of the evening and our first quiz of the whole series of Jeremiah. And this is our first question. The book of Jeremiah was written by, now isn't that kind of tricky? Jeremiah, Baruch, we don't know. Amen. You know what, we don't know is actually a very safe answer. It is a safe answer. And there are scholars today who would actually say that's the best answer. I don't agree with those except for certain parts of the book. But I would say the lion's share of the book is written by Jeremiah, but Baruch is his scribe. Some might say an amanuensis, somebody who hears his dictation. But Baruch may have actually authored some sections himself trying to fill in the blank as to what is going on. So if somebody says, oh, you're reading Jeremiah, what did Jeremiah say or what was he describing? It may be Jeremiah who said that, or it could be someone else. But you will see as we go through, there are certain sections that seem to be written by someone else. But it is primarily the prophetic word of Jeremiah the prophet. And so here's one of the reasons we go through the quiz. You're getting a handle on you know, what is actually taking place, what there is to learn. So here are your answers, Jeremiah and Baruch. Okay? Next one, number two. Jeremiah contains what types of literature? A, poetry. B, sermons. C, letters. D, narrative. Anyone take a guess? It's all of them. And so we're going to see some narrative tonight, and we're going to see poetry tonight. Um, and poetry, as we go through it, it's Hebrew poetry, so it's not like it was written by E.E. E. Cummings or you know something like that. It is poetry that is Hebrew in its nature, which practices a principle of what we call parallelism, and we'll see that unfold. Parallelism very simply means you have one line 
and then the next line repeats it using different words. And it usually adds a little nuance of meaning and it actually can make the passage pop. An example of Hebrew poetry, one of my favorite passages in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, the prophet says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Now you see those two statements? They mean the same thing, but he's repeating it for emphasis. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. So he's everlasting and creator. You see this nuance, it's changing, but the parallelism is there. Or you can even have parallelism in one paragraph mirroring another paragraph. But it really becomes powerful for talking about transcendent things. And, and we'll see that as we move on. But there's outright sermons in this book. Jeremiah goes to the king and he says, thus says the Lord, I am going to, and then Jeremiah takes a clay pot, smashes it in front of the king. This is what I am going to do to Israel. That's a pretty dramatic sermon. In fact, I thought it was so dramatic that once I bought a clay pot and I smashed it on the stage just to make the point because I'm trying to create. Jeremiah is not a boring preacher. He is not a boring preacher. He is really capturing the imagination. Next, the material in Jeremiah is presented in, now this is a very important question, in strict chronological order, B, in a somewhat haphazard order, C, based on genre, meaning this is the poetic section, these are the sermons, these are the letters, or by author preference. Now, in some respects, you may say by author preference, but it's not. Ever hear of the, the book by Blaise Pascal, Ponce? Now, it's a very famous book, but Ponce was not a book written by Blaise Pascal because he thought, I think I'm going to write a book today. It was the notes left over after he died, which somebody put together in a book. In some respects, that's Jeremiah. Baruch maybe was the one. Maybe it is somebody in the Babylonian captivity that took all this information and bound it together in a book. So here's the answer. It's in somewhat of a haphazard way. And I'm gonna give you a little description of that in a little while, but we'll show you uh, an actual outline of Jeremiah's life and how the passages unfold. And what we're gonna find is the book kind of skips around a little bit in terms of what's happening in the world geopolitic and what's happening as Jeremiah's writing. So you might find that Jeremiah 45 comes before Jeremiah 35. But we'll talk about that as we go through the book. Um, but it's good to know that principle, very important, that it is not just chronological order. Next one. The Hebrew version of Jeremiah differs from the Greek version in that it is A, longer, B, shorter, C, has a different name, D, in Greek. Now, if you put in Greek, and I'm saying the Hebrew version <laughs> differs in that the Hebrew version is in Greek, hang your head in shame. You got that one wrong, if that was the case. <laughs> now, this is going to come up from time to time. Some of you who've been in the class knows what the Greek version of the Old Testament is called. Does anyone remember? Septuagint. Thank you, brother. Septuagint. You said it also, but he said it loud because Wayne is a large mouth and it communicates, you know, very loud. You heard that sneeze he gave before, you know, it was a very powerful sneeze. Um, but yes, 200 years before the time of Christ, there were what was said to be 70 Hebrew scholars that translated the Old Testament into Greek. And it is called the Septuagint, or in Latin numerical orders, LXX, which stands for 70, because there were 70 scholars who wrote it. 
and translated. And this was because there was this famous Greek who conquered the world. Do you know his name? Alexander the Great. And that's why we have Greek diners everywhere. Not really. But maybe, maybe. But the truth was, the whole world of the time in that area became what's called Hellenized. And they all started speaking Greek. And so it was felt to be prudent as young Jews and, and were boys and girls were learning Greek and not becoming as strong in their Hebrew anymore, why not translate it into Greek? And they did. But that's very helpful for us because it is such an old translation of the Bible. This is 200 years before Christ. So we will refer to it, but here's the interesting thing of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, uh, by the way, that's a mistake. It shouldn't say Greek. Um, I'll blame my wife, but it's really my fault. <laughs> um, the reason why is somewhat of a mystery. We think the reason is that when they saw the repetitive sections of Jeremiah, they just removed that section and they kept the things that were not repetitive. Because Jeremiah in our Bibles actually has some sections that seem to repeat. So the Septuagint is a little shorter version. Next one, number five. The date of the writing of Jeremiah is probably about... Now, this is where the average person in the class says, Pastor Steve, do we really need to know dates? Come on now. And the answer is, if you really want to understand the book, the date is kind of helpful because it helps you understand when this is taking place in Jewish history. And so here's what we believe, that it was written approximately, or at least collated, I shouldn't say written, but put all together at around 550 B.C., it was at least later than uh, 587 BC. And why do I say that? Is because it ends with the destruction of the temple in 587 BC. So sometime between 587 BC and 550, we think it is written. But why isn't it written later than that? Is because the exile ends around 535, 537 BC, and that's the 70 year exile that, I, uh, that uh, Jeremiah predicted. And with that in mind, Jeremiah doesn't talk anything about the restoration of coming home back to the land. So it's gotta be between the destruction of the temple and the return of the people back to the land, somewhere in the mid of those 70 years, which lets us know it probably was written very possibly in Babylon for those people in captivity as they're putting it all together or because Jeremiah's life wraps up in Egypt could actually have been written in Egypt. And so we're, we kind of look at these pieces and we try to put them together, but that's kind of the framework of, of what we're dealing with here. So 550 BC. The nickname of Jeremiah is the laughing prophet, B, the weeping prophet, C, the rich prophet, D, the poor prophet. Anyone want to venture a guess on this one? The weeping prophet. Yeah, I, you know, I think I knew this if you asked me when I was 10 years old. It's just like people always said Jeremiah, the poor weeping prophet, you know, kind of thing. And uh, yeah, he's, he's going to have sad moments. There's no question about it. But pausing for a moment, do you ever get sad? We do. I'd say sometimes we live there. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever get angry at God? I mean, if you're honest about it. Yeah, I do. Are you allowed to pray angry prayers? You know who lets us know we can? Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 20. Oh, Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived all day long. All you give me to prophesy is doom and destruction, and I am tired of it. But if I say I will not mention you or speak any more in your name, your word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I love Jeremiah 
because he did sad. I love Jeremiah because he tells God what he really thinks. I need to know that I can do that when I feel sad. And Jeremiah feels sad. I also, did you ever have to deliver a message that you would rather anyone on the face of this earth deliver except you? Yeah, I've been there. I, I remember one time I was called to the hospital because a, a, a man was passing away very suddenly. In the morning he was healthy, by two o'clock he was gone. And mom and I had to tell two kids bounding off a bus full of joy and fun having been in school that daddy's not coming home. It was one of those moments that as a pastor I could have been anywhere in this world and be happier than being in that place right there. I also realized there was a great honor and a privilege to be with a family at their darkest moment. Very, very difficult, very hard. But imagine you're Jeremiah and God says to you, go before the king, take this clay pot with you, smash it in front of the king and say, this is what you've done to my servant Israel. Would you like to be the one who gives that message? And Jeremiah chooses to. He does it. It's hard. Anyone who's gone through a difficult moment like that can appreciate the, this book. So, yeah, he's the weeping prophet. By the way, parenthetical. What other book did he write, we think? Lamentations. Very good. Now, Lamentations by the name sound like an upbeat book. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a sad book. And that is a, taking a walk through Jerusalem after it's been destroyed. Does anyone remember offhand the happy verse in Lamentations? Yes. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then he goes right back into depression. But for that few verses in the middle of chapter 3, it's like, oh, enjoy it, bask in it, because then he gets depressed again. All right, number seven. The empire that is troubling Israel during this time is A, the Assyrians, B, the Egyptians, C, the Medes and the Persians, D, the Babylonians. And here's one of those moments again, Pastor Steve, do we really need to know this? I mean, does this have to be a history class? A little bit, it does, yes. And it actually is two primarily and one kind of with an asterisk, but it is the Assyrians and the Babylonians. But the Egyptians do play into the story, but as kind of like the asterisk. They're, they're like part of the story, but not a dominant part. And what you're finding is the, the emergence of one empire and the shrinking of another. For whatever reason, right now, I'm like super into World War II. So I'm watching all these shows on Amazon and Netflix about World War II. But if you know a little bit of world history, if you go at the beginning of the century, what might be the most powerful nation on the face of the earth? right around 1900. You may say, Great Britain. The sun never sets on the Union Jack. And if you look, I mean, Britain ruled so much of the world, really, it was incredible. But as you move through the century, at the end of World War II, Britain is becoming an island country. I mean, all its territories are now fading. You know, um, Gandhi said, I'm always grateful that I learned tea time from the Britons, but I'm glad they're gone, you know. Um, but this, you know, but at one point, everyone seemed to be like under British rule, but then they are fading. What we are having in our story is the Assyrians were the world power, but they are shrinking. And now this new little power called Babylon is in ascendancy and it is ultimately Babylon that'll bring the end of Judah. 
And so you'll see the shrinking and the increasing. And the Egyptians play into it because if you're one of these weak kings, sometimes they want to align themselves with Egypt. Maybe Egypt will save us from those mean Babylonians and it doesn't quite work out the way they hope. One more question. The one good king during the time of Jeremiah was Jehoiakim, Ammon, Zedekiah, Josiah. And the answer is Josiah. Josiah. So we have eight lovely questions. Anyone here tell me how you did? Anyone get eight? Anyone get seven? Anyone get six? Five? There you go. See? First night quiz. And we already have people who pass this quiz. That is amazing. I should ask Dr. Pete how he did, but I, I think he probably did pretty good. Some of them are like iffy. He, he might have thrown in Egypt or, you know, something like that. But it is fun to, to like test ourselves and to grow. Now, I handed out another sheet which has um, some points on it. And I actually forgot to bring one of the sheets up. It's like uh, of kind of an introduction. Yeah, that one. Thank you, Bob. You are a gentleman. I am grateful for you. Um, I, I, got, I don't need those. Thank you so much. But uh, I just want to run through these very quickly so you could have something to put on this. So I'm looking at this sheet here. And it just says author, date, theme, purpose, occasion, background. Now, if you look at a commentary, they might spend 40 to 60 pages just talking about these things. And I'm giving you like very simple, uh, short answers because I'm not expecting you guys to be super interested in all that stuff. But if we were to say who wrote Jeremiah, what would the answer be? Jeremiah, Jeremiah yes, and Baruch. Now, we, the book's not called by after him, but we unequivocally absolutely know he participated in writing the book. And so you can add his name. Now, there is also probably some collator that might have been in Babylon who participated, maybe added little sections. This we know. The book of Jeremiah as a whole is inspired, even if certain sections were written by different people. But as a whole... If you said, this is what Jeremiah is saying, generally speaking, that is what's being said. This book is about the prophet Jeremiah and his ministry. The date, what do you think might be a good date to put here? 550 is a good date for when it was written. However, now I'm going to give you a couple more dates. Jeremiah's ministry begins... 627 BC. 627 BC. Now remember, BC you get lower as you're getting closer to year zero. He finishes his ministry at 587 BC. So he begins 627 prophesying. He wraps up at eight, uh, excuse me, uh, 587. It's quick arithmetic. How long did he minister? It's 40 years. 40 years. That's a long time. I mean, these days, if you talk to somebody who's been in the business of whatever they're doing for 40 years, that is amazing. Until you think, of course, Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 70 years. I, I don't know how many kings or queens have ruled that in all of history. Um, that is like unbelievable. By the way, have you noticed like on Facebook, everyone has like throwing their quotes of the queen out there. I don't know if they're true or not, but my favorite one, and again, I don't know if it's true, is that she was talking, it said, to a chaplain. And the, the statement was, I hope Jesus returns before I die. To which the chaplain responds, why? And she responded, I want to lay my crown down before him. And I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. I don't know if it's true, but it, if it is true, wow, that was, that was awesome. I think one thing we could say, she was a gentle yet feisty woman, you know, and, uh, you know, you look at the pictures of her being, you know, what is it, 1952 she becomes queen? 
unbelievable. That is a long time. So 40 years, I'm sorry, Jeremiah, not as impressive. <laughs> However, imagine having a career of a job you do not like for 40 years. Welcome to Jeremiah's life and world. Very, very difficult. Okay, next one, theme. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about Jeremiah or even the prophets in general, what do you think the theme is? Say it again. Israel's decline, that is a good example. But I would say primarily it's the prophet's appeal, come back to the Lord, come back to the Lord. It's this deep, heartfelt, passionate, poetic letter, sermon, expression of return to the Lord. The language you're going to have and see is of a lover sometimes passionate by the way have you guys ever like bumped into any of your parents love letters you know when i took my mother into our house you know she's in her 90s now i came across all her love letters to my father now mind you they got married when she was i mean she just turned 18 uh, excuse me 19 just turned 19 and so their their dating began at like age 17 so she's a young girl I've always viewed my mother, you know, German ancestry, you know, not very emotive, not full of flowery language. I found these love letters. I asked her, is it okay with you if I read them? And at this point, she said, I don't care. You know, go ahead and read them. I have one in my briefcase. It is like, I love you more than anything. I think you're the most wonderful, amazing man I've ever met. And then it ended with this. Like 25 X's and O's, all, you know, XO, 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 which is, you know, hugs and kisses if you're not familiar with that language. It was like, is this my mom? <laughs> and it was. I mean, this, is, this was her. I was like, how come I never saw this kind of like passion and, you know, kind of thing? But she had it in her. When you look at Jeremiah, you are not looking at a stoic writer, you are sensing the passion that people would actually come to faith. And I, I would say, you know, my word to our preachers at the church, because one of my jobs is to coach our preachers. I said, if you guys are preaching from the head, that's great. You know, you need to prepare and know what you're preaching. But you need to preach from the heart because this is where people feel. And if you are not connecting with people emotionally, it's just not gonna make the difference. Some of you have heard of a, a church reformer by the name of Jonathan Edwards, um, first president of uh, Princeton, I believe. But he wrote this book called The Religious Affections. And very simply, the book conveys, you show me two people, one who affirms the biblical doctrines and another person who is in love with Jesus. Which one do you think is going to be more effective in obedience? The lover. The lover. That's what we see in Jeremiah. He is going to be speaking from the heart. And um, it's our, our goal is to get a sense of his heart, and that'll help us appreciate what he's saying. Okay, the last one. Purpose, occasion, and background. Well, simply put, we could say purpose is to see Israel return to the Lord. Except he knows the outcome because God tells him in the beginning it's going to be difficult. Occasion during the decline of the Roman, excuse me, the Assyrian Empire, during the ascendancy of the Babylonian Empire, leading up to eventual deportation to Babylon of most of the people or a good chunk of the people so the purpose it's return to the lord occasion it is during the, the the collapse of the assyrian empire the building of the babylonian empire 
and, and the background ultimately is this is what's happening in the, the world politic and now this is what's happening in Judah, the country. With that in mind, Isaiah, excuse me, um, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. Well, let me break it down. Who's the first king of Israel? Anyone remember? Saul. Saul. Second king? David. David. There's actually one in between, but he's like a nothing. Um, then we move to Solomon. And then Solomon had this brainiac son named Rehoboam. And what's Rehoboam's claim to fame? He gets the kingdom divided. To which you then have a northern kingdom called Israel, mostly in the Bible. And a southern kingdom consisting of Judah and Benjamin, which is primarily called Judah. Now, at this point in 722 BC, so that's years before, Israel falls to the Assyrians. But Judah still survives. And Judah will survive until 587 BC. But it's important to know when Jeremiah is doing his thing, Israel no longer exists as a nation, meaning the northern kingdom. But Judah does still exist. The northern kingdom never had a good king that honored the Lord. The southern kingdom had some good kings. Hezekiah, Josiah, Asa as examples. Okay, now the next slide is what you see on your sheet here. I think this is a great slide just to give you a rundown of uh, Jeremiah's life. So you see uh, born to Hilkiah, um, we'll talk about that. His calling, you'll see 17 years old. We really don't know. He could be younger, he's probably not older. Um, and that little asterisk there, that's just telling you you know, we really don't know. The Hebrew word Nahar actually means, it's usually translated a lad. But a lad can be, same word is used for Isaac when Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. But he could be 15, he could be 12. He's probably not a little boy, um, but he's a young man. Uh, and that is when God calls him. Um, then you see 35 years old, King Josiah dies. Do you remember we talked about, was King Josiah a good king or bad king? He was a good one. So when he dies, the rest of the kings of the story, you know, they're all bad. Um, then you see 40 years old, uh, I'm sorry, 39, first deportation. That's happening at 605 BC. You don't have to worry about the date there, but we'll talk about that later. But that's when Daniel gets carted off to Babylon, first deportation. Then at 40 years old, Jeremiah warns of 70 years of captivity. 46 years old, second deportation. Um, that's probably like 595, something like that. And then 50 years old, false prophet Hadaniah predicts captivity only two years. God kills him. <laughs> uh, it's a very quick uh, description there. But on the side, you see the list of these kings. So you're getting to see what I like about this graphic is where or Jeremiah is doing his thing and what kings are in place at this time. And if you can just keep in your mind the first king, Josiah, is a good king, you're actually giving yourself a good handle to understand what's taking place. Now, if you notice, it, you know, it mentions the third deportation and then 58 years old, taken by Egypt, to Egypt by force. That's the last we hear of Jeremiah. We do not know about his death. We have some you know, legendary stories about his death, but we really do not have any biblical you know, information about how he died, how long he lived, you know, those kinds of things. But we do know he ministered for 40 years. Now, here's another graphic I gave you. It's probably not gonna show up great on the screen. No, it's not really readable, but I gave you this, and it is really tiny font. And I, I could not get a, a bigger font. Pastor Nathan gave me this graphic. And this is why I love this particular graphic. I'm not gonna go over it in detail right now. But I love it because it shows you how what's going on in the book doesn't match the chapters in terms of chronology. 
So if I go to the next page of this, which is the other side of your uh, page, you'll see it mentions like where things happen. So here's a dating, 609 BC, 605 BC. But then you see chapters and you see 605, chapter 36 of Jeremiah. And then you see 605, chapter 45 of Jeremiah. And then you just go down all these dates. And what you find is generally speaking, Jeremiah moves chronologically with all these exceptions to the rule. So this is why I'm saying it's kind of like Baruch had all these prophecies of Jeremiah and then he puts them together and binds them together but his order seems somewhat haphazard and one of the reasons why people struggle with the book of Jeremiah is they get confused on the order and they're like wait a second I thought a good king was there now and you're like wait a second no 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 that prophecy is applying to a different king because the order changed in terms of it that is why so when we go through the class I'll explain we're actually now in this framework so you have to think of being oh this is during the good king or this is during the bad king um, and it'll it'll help put it together and like let me give you an example if you look on this picture here on the right on the bottom you see Jehoiakim Jehoiakim is just a flat-out bad king but then you look below him and you see Zedekiah. Zedekiah is bad, but he's like more wishy-washy. He just can't make a decision. And you're kind of like, come on, man. So he vacillates and just kind of moves back and forth. And so he's a different kind of bad king. You might say he's the incompetent king. While Zedekiah, um, am I saying his name wrong here? Yeah, Je Jehoiakim, Je Jehoiakim, excuse me, is more evil bad. Um, so you have different kinds of nuances going on. So I'm not going through this with you right now. I am showing it to you so you have an ability to look up and say, hmm, I like that. Um, it gives me a framework of what's going on. So that gives us our introduction. Now, if you want to take the actual scripture and get that in front of you, we're going to begin tonight going through the text. And I, I want to point out, I did not print up the entire book. It's 52 chapters. It would be a book in itself that I'm handing you. So I printed up the first 10 chapters. And when we get to the end of that, because my guess, we're probably going to filter out some people who are like, I'm sorry, Pastor Steve, I love you, but I don't want to be in this class. <laughs> and, you know, so if there's like three of you left at that point, then I only have to print up three of them. You know, it's just going to be a lot easier. So that's the logic of only printing up 10. OK, and and by the way, my style of teaching, quite honestly, Everything I learned about preaching and teaching, I learned in children's ministry. And here's why. I've learned that children need stories. If you try to tell children that, uh, boys and girls, I want you to appeal to the outline I handed out to you. Notice Roman numeral one. It says, what will happen to the kids in class? <sighs> However, if your teacher is a storyteller and then Jacob he sees a ladder with angels going up and down I mean what would you think if you saw angels going up and and the, the kids are wide-eyed and wow you know it's like awesome and you know what I've learned grown-ups are really just big kids <laughs> we all like stories and so I decided I don't care if I repeat a story that poor Mary here has heard 87 times. One of the reasons I call my sister Mary the teacher's pet is because, uh, number one, she's adorable. <laughs> but number two, she's tolerant. Yes, yes, I affirm Mary is a wonderful sister in Christ. But 
The other part is she's so kind when I repeat a story, she doesn't care. So, uh, you know, like Pastor Nathan, I love my brother, Pastor Nathan, but he actually, I think, keeps count. He says, Steve, I think I've heard that story six times, you know. And, and if I give one he's never heard, he goes, that was a new one, <laughs> which means I can't use it anymore for Pastor Nathan, you know. That's, that's good. So the way I talk, the way I teach is to fill it with stories because I want to keep as many people engaged as possible. And that's the way Jesus taught in stories. There was this rich man. There was this beggar. There was, you know, he just keeps telling these stories and he kept an audience that wanted to hear and learn. So we're going to find that. So let's drop into our text and I'm going to read the first paragraph. It's not going to be in the screen, but I'm going to put this up there right now. Just a little map. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anath, Anathoth, excuse me, in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And, th and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. When the people of Jerusalem went into exile, now, the first thing that should slap you across the face when we read this is you got the end right at the beginning. You don't have to look at the end of the book of Jeremiah to know how it ends. The people are going to be taken into captivity. So you might say you get the bad news first. You know, when I watch a movie with my wife, and we love to watch movies, I actually like when they show like the killing in the beginning of somebody you like, like so you don't like fall in love with this character and know, you know, uh, and then suddenly get shocked that they die in the end. I actually am glad when they show the end and, and let you know. And, and this is kind of preparing you. So that lets us know that when this book is put together, the end has already happened. So that's why we say probably in the 550 range BC, because the captivity at 587 going into exile has already happened. And so we hear the end. Now let's go back to the front. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. Uh, Hilkiah, excuse me. Hilkiah is a high priest. So what does that make Jeremiah? He's in the priestly clan. He's a Levite. That's interesting. So he grows up in a priestly family. Now here's another little piece of the story. Remember we said that first king was Saul, second king was David. When David was old, it was not clear who was going to become the next king. Now David wanted Solomon, but there was another king, Adon uh, well, a son of David, I say, Adonijah, who wanted to be king. And there was a high priest at that time who said, I am going to align myself with the Danajah. And that was Abathus. I, by the way, I'm miserable at pronouncing names. The, Dr. Pete can probably correct me, but um, that's just live with it. I stink at pronouncing names. <laughs> Pastor Steve, you went to seminary. Okay, I failed that class. Give me a break, all right? But. The bottom line is this. What was that? Yes. <laughs> um, here's, here's the thing. He is a son of a deposed high priest. Because there was another high priest at the time, you probably heard him, Zodak, or Zodak, who did support Solomon, and he became the high priest. They're both Levites, but Jeremiah is a descendant of a deposed priestly line. Does that weigh into who he is as a person? Maybe. It's interesting to know, though, when we see that. Now, we also know that when Joshua was conquering the Promised Land, 
he set aside certain towns for the priests or the Levites to live. Anathoth was one of those towns. And so it was located in the tribe of Benjamin. Now you can see this on the map. So in the middle, you see Judah. And a little bit above there, just very close, four miles away, you see Anathoth. So Bethlehem is just a little bit south, about five miles away. That doesn't show up in this map. But we're talking very close to, you know, people say to me, I was just in Nevada, and they say, where do you live on Long Island? I say, from your perspective, I live in New York City. Because, I mean, they're in Nevada. What are you going to say Long Island is? It's not upstate New York, you know? And literally, New York is two miles away from Manhasset. That's it. So from the world's perspective, yeah, I live in New York City. You know, anyone in Long Island knows it's not New York City, but for the rest of the country, they can't tell a difference. But it's not in. It was a very small town, and interestingly enough, it still exists, and it is still a very small town. It, it's not of any significance or consequence, but it was a city set aside for the Levites. So that means that Jeremiah grew up in a community where a lot of people came from the priestly community. And so that is his world. And then it says here, in territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah. So that means when it says the word of the Lord came to him, he got the first prophecy while good king Josiah was king. But here's another little piece of information. Josiah was always a decent king, but partway through his reign, he discovers the book of the law. Somebody's like cleaning in the temple and they go, hey king, I found this book. It's like maybe a Bible or something. They bring it to the king, <sighs> take all the dust off it. We believe it was probably the book of Deuteronomy. And they read it out loud. And Josiah like rips his garments. We haven't been following anything in this book. Because they realize they've just been ignoring the word of the Lord. This calling of Jeremiah was before he found the book of the law. So although Josiah's heart is good, he hasn't, I mean, everything is not aligned with where the Lord would want them to be. Um, and Josiah, one of the reasons he is such a good king is after reading the book of the law, he then becomes somebody who transforms the kingdom as, as best as a human being can do to be a kingdom that follows the Lord. By the way, interesting note, in Deuteronomy 17, so the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17 is an instruction that Moses writes for kings. And he's writing it hundreds of years before there's a king of Israel. But this is what he says. When the people call for a king, and they will, because every other nation is a king, why can't we have a king? Parenthetical thought. Doesn't Queen Elizabeth II kind of make you wish we had a king or a queen? You know, when you see somebody who's good, it's like sometimes... You know, the ones we vote for, I'm not always the thrilled with, you know. Like, sometimes it'd be nice to have a good queen or a good king. Okay, I'm off my hobby horse. Um, <laughs> but when I look at... Um, what the heck was I saying? Oh, okay. <laughs> when I look at Josiah and, and I'm seeing what's happened, here's what Moses said. When you have a king they are supposed to copy down the book of the law themselves, write it down, and then carry it with them every day. Man, I wish our leaders did that. But here you have a king of Israel. They don't even know where the book of the law is. And this is where you have a good argument for having a daily quiet time. If it's good enough for a king to do it, it's good enough for us. Carry around your Bible. I mean, now we have our phones, so we certainly can carry around our Bible and, and read it and take it from there. So he's born at that time, begins his ministry in the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. 
and then it just gives you the other primary kings that takes place. But you already see that on this when you see you know, the kings um, that are taking place. Now comes the call of Jeremiah. Somebody give me a time check. 831? Okay, great. All right, here's the call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid for, of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and the kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. That is the calling of Jeremiah. Powerful in many, many ways. Start this phrase, the word of the Lord came to me saying. That phrase, the word of the Lord, shows up in Jeremiah 49 times. 49 times. Now, there are all kinds of other ways the word of the Lord comes, but that very phrase, God's words came to me, and that is repeated again 49 times. And here those words are. Now, how did they come? It'd be kind of cool if like Baruch or somebody could say how they came was Jeremiah heard this audible voice or Jeremiah saw this. It doesn't tell us. You know, I regularly say when I'm preaching or teaching, I, I was walking along and the Lord said to me, and I know there's all kinds of people in church saying, how did he say this to you? I mean, really now, Steve, how did he say it to you? Do you hear his voice? You know, basically they want to say, are you a loon? You know, they're, they're trying to determine that. But what it comes down to is, and for those of you who've walked with the Lord for a while, you kind of become more sensitive to his voice. Here's how I hear God's voice. Uh, I, let's say I write my sermon on Friday and I'm jogging Saturday morning. And as I'm jogging, what pops into my head is, your first point makes no sense, Steve. <laughs> and you know what I'm sensing is the Lord telling me, you need to write that first point and here's what you need to say. I find that's a way the Lord speaks to me. Here's another way. I'm reading a passage that I have read maybe a hundred times, but suddenly it pops. And I'm like, wow, I've never seen that before. And I say, thank you, Lord. I think your spirit has communicated to me. Another way the Lord speaks is when somebody puts their arm around you and says, Steve, can I give you a word of advice? And the moment they give it to me, the Holy Spirit says, listen, they're talking for me right now. I've had that happen numerous times. And my point is you and I, if we walk with the Lord in regular conversation, which means regular prayer, regular Bible reading, your ear is going to be more and more sensitive to what the Lord is saying. And so when I see a passage like this, I'm not sure. It may have been an actual audible voice. It may have. We don't know. But we do know this. Jeremiah was absolutely convinced it was the word of the Lord that he received. And so I would say, if you haven't felt like the Lord's talking to you, be open to his spirit. Some of This is a story that I've repeated, but it's a good one. So in 2008, I was riding in the car to a prayer conference from, to Tuscarora. And I was riding from New York. That takes two hours. And I'm in the car with a man named David Miles. And David is a straight shooter. He tells you what, you, what he thinks. And so David Miles, he comes to church here at the time, and he asked me a question. He said, Steve, I'm just curious. Do you do much reading? And I answered honestly. 
not as much as I'd like. And he said, I thought so. I've been listening to your sermons. Now I realized I was just rebuked, you know, because he said, I'm listening to your sermons and it's obvious you don't read many books. And I said, instead of being defensive, which is your natural tendency, I felt the Spirit of God say to me, he's speaking for me. And I said to David, what do you think I should do? And he said, I, you already have the best job on earth. You get to be a pastor of a great church. Go back to seminary, get your doctorate. It'll force you to read. You just have to read books to take past classes. I registered within six months, started school. And that was, by the way, school, when I, I graduated with my doctorate in 2015, that was when the Lord also told me, okay, now I want you to begin a transition to a younger pastor. You know, all those things are all the Lord speaking step by step. By the way, in 2008, he didn't tell me the rest of the story. He only told me the first part of the story. Go back to school. So I'm just saying, be optimistic. The Lord will speak to you too. By, by, the, by the way, when he's speaking to you, it's not Jeremiah. You're not, your words are not going to be scripture. This is a little different. This is at a higher level. But he does speak to you if you're listening. So here's what we see. Powerful words. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So people wonder about why do Christians hold to not being thrilled about abortion? It's verses like this. Because God has a purpose for us even in the womb. And so that tells us that this is a, you know, a, a being that has value, that has, that has life. Um, by the way, I always like to give a parenthetical thought. While Christians generally do not affirm abortion, we do affirm the forgiveness of God also. And so any of us who've gone down paths that are not necessarily the best paths we could have taken, we have a God who's so gracious and so love that. But here's a reason why we value life. Isn't that amazing? Jeremiah, God had a plan when he was just stating so cool. Before you were born, I set you apart. My brother Pete, Dr. Pete, would we say, Dr. Pete, that you have a strong view of the sovereignty of God? Yes, yes he does. My brother is, could be called in the Reformed tradition, or to put it simply, a Calvinist. And Oh, it's not. It's, it's not like a virus, and you can be healed of it. You can, you know. <laughs> Now, in fact, when he teaches a class, he will probably quote John Calvin a couple times, you know, because he loves his commentaries and, and things like that. But my point is, this phrase is very Calvinistic. God has a plan. And then this is part of the plan. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, this is extremely important. Do not miss it. God is not a deity of a little tiny country located in the land of Palestine. He views himself as the only God, authority over all the nations, all the nations. And so when Jeremiah is a prophet, he is not just a prophet to a little country. God is exerting his statement here over all the nations. You know, two years ago when we had our presidential election and everybody's hyperventilating, <laughs> what's going to happen, you know, all this kind of stuff. I always love to quote verses like this, like Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been explained to you from the beginning? I sit enthroned above the circle of the earth. I bring princes to naught and reduce rulers to nothing. And so breathe in, breathe out. God's still on the throne. We need to know that. God is over the nations, not just a little tiny country called Judah. So, pretty heavy news. Now, just imagine Mary may have been 14 years old when an angel came to her and said, Greetings! You're going to give birth to the Messiah. How are you at 14 to receive information like that? So, Jeremiah could be in that same ballpark, 14, 15, 16, 17, when God says to him, you're going to be my spokesman to the nations. 
I would find that a little unnerving, personally. And yet, that's what he hears. So he responds. Uh, uh, alas, uh, excuse me, sir. Um, I do not know how to speak. I am young. I think that's fair for him to say that. I do not know how to speak. I am young. But here comes a principle that you should learn in your life, if you haven't already. If God's asking you to do something, is he going to give you the strength to do it? Yes, he will. Just keep that in mind. I, I love the Hillsong song, which has the line, he calls me out upon the waters. You know, where, where you're going to sink unless God helps you. Uh, Toby Mac, you know, uh, pop singer, uh, rap singer, Christian singer, but he says that in one of his songs, you always bring me to water that's over my head. And that's what God does. He actually wants his people to depend on him. So if you have too much month left at the end of the budget, in other words, you ran out of money and there's still a month to go, he's placing you in a situation where you have to rely on him. And one of the cool things about that is you start to see some miracles happen. You know, some of the people who see the fewest miracles are sometimes the wealthiest people because they're never depending on the Lord. But the people who are like on the edge of starvation, when that food comes, they're like, oh God, so thank you so much. You're, you're so full of gratitude, you're depending on the Lord. So he says, I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, don't say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. And now comes the words. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Now, I read this statement, and I happen to know the rest of Jeremiah's life. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be thrown into pits. And I'm like, Lord, could you help me here? What is your definition of rescue? Because what I would personally like is that you don't let them throw me into the pit. That you don't let them beat me. That would be my first choice, Lord. But apparently, that's not the Lord's definition of rescue. The Lord's definition of rescue is you'll make it. You will make it. You will. You'll get through this. Even if the ultimate restoration is glory, you will make it. So let's keep that in mind. When he says, I will rescue you, he's not saying your life is going to be easy. But he's saying you will have sufficiency for everything you need. And he goes on. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth. Now here's one of those moments. What did he feel? Did he actually touch, feel something touch him? Do you remember when Isaiah was called? One of the seraphim take a live coal from the altar and touch his lips and say, your sins have been atoned for. I mean, was it an actual live coal that came to him? I don't know. I mean, it sounds that way. That's the way it's describing. And so I see this and I see maybe there was a little touch. Have anyone felt in your life like you felt like maybe the touch of an angel or something? I see a couple nods. You know, in, in 2000 excuse me, in 1992, my brother was diagnosed with a brain tumor and he had surgery. The doctor comes out of surgery and comes to my parents, my brother at the time was 40, and says, I'm sorry, the tumor I just took out of your son's head is malignant. He needs to get his affairs in order. There's really little we can do. About an hour before then, my father was at the Sloan Kettering Chapel by himself, praying for his son who was in surgery. While he is there, he feels a hand on his shoulder and a man says to him, I'm going to answer your prayer. Uh, excuse me, the Lord is going to answer your prayer. 
He t- looks, turns around, nobody is in the chapel with him. An hour later, the doctor says it's hopeless. But he had that weird experience in the chapel. The pathology report comes back three days later and says it is the slowest growth tumor possible and he can go back to work. What a difference between first report and three days later. My father looked at that as an angelic touch to say, I got this. I got this. By the way, to tell you the rest of the story, my brother lived for another 10 years. He did ultimately succumb, but that wasn't the time that he was going to pass. God was going to give him another 10 years. He went back to his wife, went back to the Long Island Railroad, continued ministry, led people to Christ. God had work for him to do, but that wasn't his time. My simple point is there could have been a little touch here. Say it again. Sure. When my brother was in the hospital in the city, your mother or brother? My mother and my son okay. had gone to see him, and we were on the Long Island Expressway, and my car died. Two people stopped to help. They couldn't help me. Third person came. He fixed the car for me to get off the highway, and he said, Get off this highway. There's a there's a station. You pull in and have it fixed. Follow me there, and he disappeared. I always felt that was that was an angel. I always felt that way. If if everyone heard, she had an experience. You got heard it way back there on the LIE where her car fails. Two people try to help. They can't. The person who and the third person helps directs her disappears. I'm just saying, if a God who can speak the world into existence created this world, he can touch you. He can touch you. There used to be a song by Bill and Gloria Gaither, which kind of dates me, called He Touched Me. And and that is metaphorical, and sometimes it's real. But this is what he said. He said, I touched his lips. He says, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations, kingdoms, Now that's, again, unbelievable. And what you see here are couplets, nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down. That's parallel, they're saying the same thing. To destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. These couplets all communicate God's authority over all the nations. Does God have authority over Russia? Yes, he does. Does God have authority over the United States? Yes, he does. Does God have authority over India? Yes, he does. Every time we have this anxiety in our world because we read something in the news, just keep in mind that the sovereign God who apparently has a plan is weaving his plan, even through things like COVID, for accomplishing his purposes. He brings glory to himself. And so when you are anxious, when you worry, just keep in mind, he's over it all. And just because you can't figure it out, I want you to answer this question. Do you have a finite mind or an infinite mind? I think fairly we can say we have a finite mind, but the one we worship has an infinite mind and he knows the beginning from the end so we can take comfort. Now comes the first prophecy, verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? So he sees some kind of vision. And he says, I see an almond branch, I replied. The Lord said to me, you've seen correctly. Now watch the response. Now here's a way of interpreting. For I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Now, what does watching have to do with an almond branch? In their culture, the almond tree was the first one to bud. So that meant spring is coming. So people wanted to see the first almonds because they're like, finally, spring is here, winter is over. That's the connection between almonds and watching. 
And so he says, what do you see? I see an almond branch. So for Jeremiah in his world, that's good news. That's, that's spring, restoration of all that is you know, worn out from the winter. And God says, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. That's good news. That tells us that God does not let his word return void. His word will come true. So when we see promises from God in the book of Jeremiah, they will happen in God's time and in God's way. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, verse 13, the word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? And he says, I see a pot that is boiling. I answered, and it is tilting toward us from the north. Now, what in creation is going on? Let me show you a little artist rendition of this. Here you go. This huge pot this artist draws, and it's a pot that's pouring from the north. Now, what is interesting with this, and now here's where knowing a little geography helps. Do you remember I told you what's going on in the world when we were going through the introduction? What was the big empires that were existing? One was the Assyrians. So here is a picture of the Assyrian Empire. Now, the reason why you see different colors, because it's depicting their different periods of expansion all around. And this starts crumbling in the mid-600s. So in the beginning of Jeremiah's prophesying, the Assyrian Empire exists, but it's getting weak. Then this little map shows you how Babylonia is coming into ascendancy and they're making incursions into the Assyrian Empire, conquering ultimately Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, and moving to what becomes the Babylonian Empire, which is what you see here. All of these empires, if you look in the map where Judah is, are to the north. And so what he sees is a pot pouring out from the north. And so this is what the Lord goes on to say. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms. Now it's plural because it's the Assyrians and the Babylonians declares the Lord. Now comes a poetic section. And this is why I captured on my handout to you the poetry. That's where you see the indentation. And it says here, their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. Now, for you and I, when we think of gates, we think of doorways. We think of Middle East, uh, excuse me, uh, Middle Ages, and you might have these big gates, and they close them. You think of Lord of the Rings, and they have these big gates, and you're trying to burst through. In the ancient world, gates are the seat of government. And so what you see in this picture is actually a tell in Israel called Lachish. And what you're seeing is the city gates. And what they are are multi-chambered gates. And what an artist did is drew up one section where you see it might have looked like, and then on the other side is what it looks like to this day. But what this is, in the ancient world, the seat of government is the gates. So this is where you went to the city gates. For example, if you ever remember the story of Ruth, when Boaz is trying to make a deal to have Ruth and Naomi become his family, he goes to the city gate, gathers the elders, and has this transaction. In Proverbs 31, where is your husband going to praise you if you're a decent woman? At the city gates. He's hanging out at the city gates. I want to tell you about my wife. She's amazing. That's all taking place. So when you see here, in the entrance of the gates, they're setting up their thrones. Those are synonymous, seat of government and, and the gates. They will come against her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people. And here's a purpose clause. Because of their wickedness in forsaking me. Here is your first statement of judgment in the book of Jeremiah. Somebody give me a time check. I can't see that clock. 
A51. Thank you, Brother Wayne. I'm so grateful. You were so helpful. Thank you. Um, here's the first statement. Because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods. And now here's the parallelism. And in worshiping what their hands have made. So it's saying the same thing. It's saying it differently. That is Hebrew poetry. And by the way, when you actually look at a Hebrew Bible, you don't see indentations. That's an English thing to do. But the reason why we know it's poetry, because this poetic flavor takes place and they see the parallelism appear. And so the scholars today translating it are able to do our English style and indenting it so that we, the reader, know it is poetry as to what's been happening. So he goes on to say, verse 17, get yourself ready, stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today, I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Here's the first verse that you might want to memorize. I am with you, I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Just to have that in mind. So, does Jeremiah have reason to press on? Does God giving him reason? What does Jesus say to us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. What, is he, what does Paul say in Romans 8? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor things to come. And he, These are themes that go all through the scripture. And Jeremiah is hearing this. But now I just want to be honest for a second and say, I'm still not sure I want his job. Hey, Jeremiah, I'm going to give you rotten sermons to deliver but I'll be with you. Thanks, Lord, but can you give me a happy sermon? I want the Joel Olstein version. You know, you can make it. We can do this. And by the way, there is definitely a place for encouragement. I am not throwing a stone, but I am saying Jeremiah didn't get that ministry. He got the tough one. So what we're going to do to wrap up tonight is just wade in now to the first extended poetic section. We're not going to finish chapter two at all. But I want to give you a flavor of it, and we're going to end with, I think, a very important verse. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. So this is his first sermon that he's given out. He says this. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. What is this describing? Leaving Egypt. Remember when we began that journey together? And listen how he's speaking as a lover. I remember the devotion of your youth. Remember I told you that love letter my mother wrote to my dad when she's like 17 years old? You know, I'm married to Michelle now for 37 years. Hey, honey, when you're in the fridge, can you get me a soda, please? You know, that's now. But, you know, back when I was dating her, Michelle, the fairest of them all. You're so beautiful. You're so amazing. Now, if I use that language, she might throw something at me because what do you want? You know, <laughs> is what it would come down to. And But the Lord is saying... Remember that. Think back to when you had those affections. He goes on, verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. What you pursue, 
you become. What you pursue, you become. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through the land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels or lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit, its rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. Now here comes another parallel. Remember how verse 6 began? They did not ask. Verse 8. The priests did not ask. Where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. So what he's doing is saying, you never even called to me and asked me. They're stories. You know, my family, they are so sick and tired of daddy telling the story about when I was healed from myocarditis. Happened in September 1991. And you poor members of this church have heard Pastor Steve tell the story many, many times. But you know what? I will tell the story till I die. Because there was a moment in my life when the Lord touched me. We have a sister right here, sitting right in the front row. It was 19, uh, 2008. Our sister right here came to me and said, Pastor Steve, the Lord is going to heal you of your Meniere's disease, which is vertigo and dizziness that I was dealing with. Now at the time, I said, thank you very much for your word. And I didn't really believe very much that this was going to happen. She said it was going to happen in the new year. I don't know if you remember that. Then January came and all my symptoms went into remission. It's been that way ever since. I tell this story over and over because I don't want to be one of these people. They didn't even ask. And so, you know, when I'm in the hospital now, I'm in North Shore Hospital, St. Francis, and somebody's having open heart surgery. I said, I don't know what the Lord's going to do with your surgery. I don't. But let me tell you what he did for me. And this is why I'm going to believe that if God who created the heavens and the earth is involved, let's expect anything to happen. Let's anticipate from a great God we expect great things. And let's go to pray. I don't want to be these people who do not say, where is the Lord? We should say, where is the Lord? He wants to be asked that. Which brings us now to the last section I'm going to do. We're going to wrap up here. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord. Now begins what's called a lawsuit metaphor. He's building a case. That's why he says, I'm bringing these charges against you. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and look. So he says, look at the pagans. Take a peek at the pagan countries. Go to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? It generally doesn't happen. What do people generally worship in India? Hinduism, general dominant view. Japan, Shintoism, Korea or China, Buddhism, Egypt, Islam. It just doesn't happen. Not so with my people. My people, they came believing. And, and by the way, he says, parenthetical thought, they are not even gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens. Shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. And here's where I want to end, because I love this imagery. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. This is at Dan, the most northern part of Israel. When you think of Israel, you probably think dry desert. This is gushing with cool, fresh springs. This is the headwaters of the Sea of Galilee. It's gorgeous, rushing and sound. I actually have a film of it just listening to this. You have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And you have dug for yourself cisterns 
A cistern is a hole in the ground that holds water. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. This kind of poetry is what moves me. So I have uh, uh, one of my kids not walking with the Lord like I want them to do right now. Now, because they're my child, I love this child to death. You know, I, I love them. I pray this prayer over my child every day. This very line. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold any water. And what I, what I tell, not just to my child, but to anyone, what the world's offering you is a broken cistern. And what God is offering you is living water. Which one do you want? That's the heart of Jeremiah the prophet. So what his dream is, is to reach this people. Now I close with this final story. <coughs> well, I was in Rwanda, and Rwanda has a very dark history. I think it was 1991, 92, something like that, that the genocide took place. And so I was at the genocide memorial and in a piece of land about the size of Syosset campus are 300,000 people buried in mass graves. 300,000 people. I mean, it takes your breath away when you think of it. But here's what makes me wrecked over it. I had a missionary friend who was there in Rwanda before the genocide. He preached his heart out to these folks basically saying, choose living water, not a broken cistern. But when the Hutus and the Tutsis, one tribe kill, trying to kill the other tribe, started taking place, he watched people in his own church kill each other. He came home broken, wounded. I mean, he needed counseling for some time after that. That is kind of like Jeremiah. He's preaching from his heart and wanting them to choose the living water. But ultimately, they will not. But this book was written not just for them, but for us. And so we have that opportunity to choose the living water. So when we hear Jeremiah passionately saying, choose life, He's speaking to you and I as much as he's speaking to them because that's why this book has been preserved for all generations. Well, that Father, we thank you that we've had a great opportunity to begin our journey together. I pray, Lord, that you will expand our imaginations to believe that we are going to learn great things from you through this prophet. Lord, we're so grateful for this opportunity to do this together, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.